So my name is Nikki Thanos, and I'm a consultant and a trainer for the Bertha Justice Institute. And I know that today already has been a magical day, and I'm here to tell you that it is just going to get better. If you have not yet had the chance to meet Philip Agnew, you are in for a true treat. Um, Philip grew up in Chicago and cut his teeth as an organizer while a student, hey Chicago, um, while a student at Florida A&M University. He now serves as the executive director of the Dream Defenders, a movement that grew out of the grief and the outrage and the very visionary organizing following the murder of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida in February of 2012. In protest, um, Philip and uh, some 60 other youth organize, organizers marched three days, 40 miles, building relationships along the way. And when that group came out of the march, um, they realized that they had, they had built something together, something much bigger than just that moment. And that was the birth of the Dream Defenders. Arriving in Sanford, the group, they locked arms to block the entrance of the Sanford Police Department. It would be their first of many collective victories, the first of many moments in power, the first of many direct actions. Um, the group demanded that Zimmerman be arrested and charged. He was. They demanded that the Sanford police chief resign. He did. They demanded that a community board be established to monitor the, to monitor the police. That board was established and up and running by the end of the year. After Zimmerman was acquitted, the Dream Defenders took over the Florida State Capitol for an awesome 31 days and proposed a package of bills, no, bills known as Trayvon's Law, uh, seeking, seeking to really undo the whole legal infrastructure that codifies racial profiling, that targets youth of color, and legalize the shoot first policies known as so-called self-defense laws. So their month-long, 24-hour-a-day dream-in was the longest sit-in in the entire state history of Florida. Yeah. <laughs> and since then, the Dream Defenders truly have not rested, continuing to build a robust ne network on college campuses across Florida. So um, I asked some folks in preparing to introduce him, you know, so tell me about, tell me about Philip. What's he like? And these are the words that they said. Inspiring, gives generously of his time, approachable, democratic, down to earth, talented singer, <laughs> disciplined, inclusive, visionary, humble, and I think very important for today, rooted and deeply reflective about the history that he comes from. My first contact with him was actually on a YouTube clip that was circulating around Facebook um, after the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Uh, he, he put out a speech that he actually didn't get, get to give that day because his, uh, the, at the last minute, his speech was cut due to time constraints. And I remember, if you haven't seen the clip, you should go back and watch it. Um, it really gave me chills, and I remember thinking, you know, he is right. The youth will rise, and our time is indeed now. So it is a deep honor to introduce uh, one of my uh, young heroes and friends and comrades. If you can please join me in giving not a lawyerly welcome, but let's give like a real people's welcome to Philip Agnew. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Nikki. Um, sounds like you just called my mom for <laughs> this. That, that's, that, that, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really exciting to be here. Uh, it's really exciting to, um, to be invited anywhere. Uh, later on, uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, well, when people are trying to kick you out every day, sometimes it's, it's good to be invited. And um, so this evening uh, or this afternoon, you all will hear from uh, Harry Belafonte. And uh, so I, I'm the opener for, uh, for Mr. B. And uh, something he always tells me whenever I ask him, how is he doing? He always says, better than I deserve, every time. And so, uh, 
and, and so I, I really I feel that way this morning um, or this afternoon um, that I am doing better than I deserve. And I think we all are um, to a large extent. Um, before I before I begin, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank Porvi for having me, um, for inviting me. Y'all give it up for her visionary leadership um, and uh, and uh, shepherding us here, myself and Ahmad. Want to give a special shout out to Ahmad. If you haven't met Ahmad, our legal and policy director, please make sure you do. Um, shout out to Sophia Campos with United We Dream, my sister in the struggle. Uh, Mina from Florida Legal Services is there. Alana Greer from Florida Legal Services. Chuck is here. The Florida contingent is here. Um, that's why you don't mention names, because then you're scared you're gonna you're scared you're gonna miss someone. I love I, okay everyone. I love you all. I love you all. Um, so so today I wanna um, use the time that I have with you all. I come from a, a preaching background. And uh, uh, a lot of the oral tradition in the delivery of sermons is, a, is call and response. And so I thrive, I thrive from being able to be in an exchange with the audience. And so I would like to, for my time that I've been allotted, limit the amount of time that I'm speaking at you um, and then yield the remainder of that time for maybe some questions and answers or conversation and, uh, and if that suits you all, I, I'd like for that to be our time together. Is that okay? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, cool. Um, I'd also like to talk really simply, um, to, to speak in very simple words. I'm going to avoid the platitudes, um, partially because in a room full of lawyers, I think that kind of evens the playing field for myself. And also because I feel like at the root of many of the issues that we're facing, there lies some very simple values. Um, and so we don't need to use too much time using fancy words for them because we're here to talk about justice. We're here to talk about love. We're here to talk about power. And we're here to talk about humanity. Very simple words with varied meanings, but very powerful words, um, and, and words that we often use, um, but don't reflect in our daily lives, and surely not in the ways that we govern our country, in the ways that we uh, protect our communities, um, and in the ways that um, our government uh, treats its people. Um, I'd like to start with a, a bit of a, a, a small story, um, and this story um, takes place 50 years ago in a neighborhood about 25 minutes from here, according to Google Maps. <laughs> that neighborhood is Kew Gardens. Anybody familiar with Kew Gardens? Okay. Well, about 50 years ago, there lived a woman there named Kitty Genovese. Kitty Genovese lived with her partner above a bar. Kitty Genovese every day went to work in the quiet, tranquil neighborhood in Queens without incident, until she didn't. On the last day of her life, as she walked home from work, she was attacked by an unknown assailant. He stabbed her with malice and with hate in his heart. He continued to stab her. And as any of us would do, as we would see our life flashing before our eyes, she screamed for help. She thought that her neighbors, the people that lived on her block, would surely hear her screams for help and would rush to her rescue. She screamed and a few people turned on their lights in the house and she saw a few curtains move, I'm sure, and her assailant ran away. But in, after a few minutes, those lights went dark and those curtains were closed and her assailant ran back to finish the job that he had started. And he continued to stab her. Kitty Genovese was a strong woman and she continued to scream, help me, help me. She continued to beg for help as the assailant continued to stab her. 
A few more lights flickered, and the assailant again retreated into the darkness for fear that someone would see him. A few minutes later, seeing no one, he returned to the lobby of her building where he finished the job, and Kitty Genovese was dead. Now, unfortunately, New York then wasn't known as the safest big city in the world. And so a crime like that could happen every day. But what was notable about this story was a report that came out a few weeks later. And in that report that has since been disputed, I'll be, I'll be fair and objective in my delivery. But as the story was told then, a police report noted that 38 people had heard her screams for help. 38 people had peered out their window and saw a woman being stabbed to death. 38 people had heard her screams. 38 people had turned down their television. 38 people had been rustled from their sleep. And that 38 people did nothing. Not one person called the police. Not one person alerted the authorities. Not one person came out to try to see the source of the screams. Not one person stood up to save Kitty Genovese's life. When the police report was read and the news report came out a few weeks later, there was a line that stood out that shook many in, in, in the city of New York. It was from an elderly man who said that he had heard the screams and when the police asked him why he didn't do anything, his response was, I just didn't want to get involved. A very sad story indeed. But even 50 years later, in New York, and let's be fair, in cities around the country and around the world, there is a pervasive mentality that reflects the sentiments of that elderly man 50 years ago. I just don't want to get involved. I missed his remarks this morning, but I hear that the right Reverend Bill Quigley <laughs> asked that we run towards the fire. He asked that in times like these that the people in this room join together not to huddle, not to avoid trouble, not to avoid sacrifice, but to run towards the screams for help. I came by this morning just simply to tell you all in very simple terms that we must get involved. There is a war going on beyond these walls. And it is no exaggeration. We are losing a generation of young people. We are losing a generation of immigrants that came to this country and under the pretenses of false promises. We are in danger of losing a generation of people who feel that they'd rather stay in the closet than come out of it. We are losing a generation of people to the shadows. We are losing families. We are losing mothers. We are losing fathers. And there is something that we can do about it. There is something that we must do about it. The title of our, our conference is 50 Years of Radical Lawyering Since Freedom Summer. And in keeping with our theme of being simple, I'd like to ask, does anybody know the true meaning of radical? Does anybody? One person? Mm. Give it up for this brother. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> it means to get at the root of something. Now, 
in America, when someone is deemed a radical, they're usually deemed a kook, somebody a little bit crazy, somebody a little bit unreasonable. But when you look at the true nature of the word radical, it means to strike at the root, to strike at the root of an issue, the root of a problem, or maybe just to get back to our roots. And at our root, if we search in a very radical way, we must once again find our humanity. Because today, there's a fundamental question going on in America. In the Constitution, or is it the Bill of Rights? We the people, what is that? That's why I'm not here. I'm <laughs> there's a question about who is the people, not who are the people. But who is the people in, in those three words, we the people? Who is deserving of humanity in this country? Who is deserving of those unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And never since America, never since America was founded have we considered everyone in this room human. And even today, we throw labels on top of people to cover up our humanity, allow it for it to not feel so horrible for us to dehumanize people. Many of us know the labels, felon, illegal, criminal, insurgent, terrorist. These terms allow us to then allow for those very people to lay festering in jails around this country. They allow for our country and all of us in it to stand by and say, I don't want to be involved because that person deserves what's happening to them. They're a criminal. They're a thief. They're a terrorist. <clears throat> and so we must today, in speaking about radical lawyering or radical activism or radical anything must get back to the root of our humanity. We must reconnect with that ability to see ourselves in someone else. And I contend that if we are able to begin there at that radical place, at the root, then all of our individual movements, all of the work that we do around the economy, around equal rights to love and to marry, around racial equality, around criminal justice will be that much easier. Because when you see yourself in someone else, you cannot allow for a family to be separated and look the other way. You cannot allow for a brother or sister or anything else in the spectrum of gender to live in the shadows anymore. You cannot allow for what we see in the city of Miami every day a new building to go up on the ocean and just blocks away meet young people that ain't never been to the beach. You can't allow that because you've struck at the root, the radical notion of it all, and we need today radical thought. We need today radical action. Not crazy, not kooks, but people who are prepared to take this country back to the root of life, of love, of liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the amendments are some beautiful words. I think words are powerful, but only when they're buttressed by actions. I'd like to bring up another word to you all. I like words. Words are, words are awesome. Have y'all, no, 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 we'll talk about it later. <laughs> there was a time 400 years ago where if I had accrued a debt that, and if I couldn't pay it, I would go before the debtor or the debt master or whoever held my debt or the debt judge, and I could present myself as a member in debt and say I couldn't pay it. I cannot pay this debt. And there was a time that 400 years ago, if I couldn't pay my debt, that a friend of mine could stand up. And that friend could say, I will assume this debt with him. 
the burden of his debt can fall evenly upon my shoulders as it does his or hers. And there was a time when the word for that action was solidarity. It meant that I am in debt with you. I will share this burden with you. And so today as we go to the root, a radical notion of what it means to challenge the power structure and oppressive systems, we must reevaluate that word solidarity. Because when I say I'm in solidarity with you and you with me, I don't mean in the lefty sense of the word, the, the, the kind that fits on t-shirts and on water bottles and on bumper stickers, but the kind that means that whenever you feel pain, I too feel pain. Whenever the weight of the debt and the isolation and the depression that you feel weighs down on your shoulders and it weighs a ton that it may weigh half because I'm standing next to you. I'm standing here in solidarity with you. And so as we leave today and as we go about our work, we must remember that solidarity is more than a word if we do what? Believe in it radically. We can also talk about love. A word that comes and goes. For my gospel people, y'all know. But for you people, really. OK. Kind of <laughs> sectioned off the room a little bit. Some people get it, some people don't. It's a gospel song written by Kirk Franklin a few years ago. And the chorus said, love a word that comes and goes. But few people really know what it really means to love. Now, love means a lot of different things. Music Soul Child talked about love, too. Maybe more people know Music Soul Child <laughs> or less. I don't know. <laughs> right. OK, there we go. But love means nothing without what? Without action. Love must be acted upon. There are many that live in this country that know that love is only just a word when given by some. But when we leave this room, and we go about our individual fights every day, we must remember that love is an act. And in order for us to feel the fullness of our love, in order for us to feel the fullness of what the writers of that word meant, we must express, express it in an action. So we must have radical love, radical solidarity, in order to be radical lawyers, radical human beings. We've got some real issues in Florida um, and around the country that I, I'd like to elevate before I leave you all today. Our schools are crumbling. Now, there are some that would say the answer to that is no standardized test. I think that is one answer to it. But I think a standardized test, no matter how good it is, that teaches our children that America is an amazing country, a liberator of people, is still a bad test. So we must have a radical notion of school. There are some that would say we need better buildings and better books, but I contend if we don't have the support systems in those schools, and the books that we have tell us lies about our history, erase the, the, the participation of Filipinos in the farm workers movement or the leadership of women in the civil rights movement, or the solidarity between peoples during all of those movements, then you could keep the books in the buildings. We need a radical notion of schools. There are some that say we need to eliminate zero tolerance policies. I say that is an answer. That is an answer. A very good answer, one that we're working towards. Because our children live in schools where police officers shepherd over them like pre-detention camps, just waiting for the opportunity to cover them in the sewage of the school to prison pipeline. We need a radical notion of education in this country. And so as we go into our work, we should go into it, we should go into it with the notion that starts at the root in our pedagogy. I said I wouldn't do the words, but I, I, that is one of my favorite words, OK? Because our schools mostly teach our young people to be manufacturers be complicit with the system. 
not to question, not to critically think. And so we must radically think there as well. We have a scourge of mass incarceration whose dark clouds hover over this country and abroad. For the same companies that imprison our people here, the same companies that profit from a dragnet over immigrant and black and brown communities and poor communities around the country, also incarcerate Palestinians, also incarcerate South Africans. There's a scourge of incarceration around this country, and so we must have a radical notion of what it means to bring somebody to a place where they can once again be reentered back into society. So we need a radical notion of what it means to punish or what it means to heal, what it means to rehabilitate. Because the path we're on right now will surely lead to destruction, will surely lead to a generation of young people who are rendered jobless, educationless, self-esteemless. And what are we going to do with that? We must do something about mass incarceration. We must do something about the new Jim Crow. You must read Michelle Alex Alexander's book. You must realize, you must realize that if we don't do anything about companies like the GEO Group, like G4S, like CCA, then surely that wildfire that just burns in poor communities, that wildfire that just burns in black and brown communities will surely reach your homes. Because the incarceration monster is an insatiable one. They will criminalize any behavior they can. They will make it illegal to be poor, as they already have. They'll make it illegal to be gay. They'll make it illegal to be, well, it's already illegal to be black. It's always been illegal to be black. They will criminalize any behavior that people in this room, when they hear about it, will close their doors, close their windows, turn off their lights, and say, I don't want to be involved. They will ram it through. And I think we should leave here with hope and optimism, but also a dose of radical realism. They win it. They win it. They're making money, billions upon billions off of our children. State of Florida spends five times as much on incarcerating a child than it does to educate a child. And so what are we doing? We're dooming them to low-income jobs. We're dooming them to make money on the black market. We're dooming them to recidivism. We're dooming our country. We're dooming them to second-class citizenship. We're dooming our country to a lack of real democracy when millions upon millions of people are excluded from the ballot box every two to four years. We have a real problem, and the people in this room must do something about it. We must do something about racial profiling and police brutality. Luckily, we're amongst people who have battled backstop and frisk. But stop and frisk in New York and in cities around the country will not go away. Uh, in Miami Gardens, they're calling it Suspect City now. 8,000 young people arrested in one year. No, 8,000 young people stopped in one year. It's, in, it's important that I make that distinction because not one of them was arrested. There's police reports that show that they stopped the same person in 20 minute increments, three different officers. They're stopping people 40 times. The police, sh the sheriff is coming in or the police chief is coming in every day and saying, we're gonna stop every, every black boy 12 to 35, stop. Is this the country that we wanna live in? We need a radical notion of what it means to protect and to serve our communities. And we have an opportunity here I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that we had an opportunity. I don't mean just here in this room, but here in this moment with each of you all. I'm excited. I'm pumped. I believe the isms, and I, I won't get too, too into each of them, but I believe they're in a state of crisis. As you look around the country, there are people rising up from the gutters to say no more. Even here, the dreamers are saying not one more deportation, not one more family separated. 
You know, people standing up. If you read the cover of Times, Time this, this month, people saying, I will no longer subscribe to your definition of gender and sexuality. There's a lot of stuff going on, and y'all got to get involved. We must be involved. The very future of our country depends on it. The future and the legitimacy of your profession depends on it. The future, I was going to say America, <laughs> legitimacy of America, but that it didn't work with the, with the whole theme of things. But we have an opportunity, right? Because the America of yesterday we inherited, but the America of tomorrow is ours. The America of tomorrow is ours. We look back 50 years because those were times of both great, great crisis and great triumph. We look to leaders like Ella Baker, like Rosa Parks, like Bayard Rustin, like Martin Luther King Jr., like Malcolm X, like Marcus Garvey, like Wilhelmina Jakes in Tallahassee, like the Greensboro, the Montgomery, the Selmas. And we look to them with great reverence, as we should. But I got to tell you all, I'm tired of looking at black and white films of revolution. I want to be a part of some Technicolor HD. 3D surround sound revolution. Yeah. And that's why we're here. I don't know if some of y'all get extra credit for being here, but I think the majority of folks that are here are here to talk about getting back to the root, about getting involved. And that's what we have the opportunity to do. That's what we've been given the chance to do on the backs the blood, sweat, and tears of those that we revere, we've been given a chance to say no more. 50 years ago, in a Birmingham jail, Dr. King laid out his thesis on why we couldn't wait. Because there are those in government that would tell us to wait, that we're moving too fast on immigration, we're moving too fast on, on equal equality and pay, we're just moving too fast. And someone said yesterday, Trumpka said yesterday, it, we, will, we will get old very quick if we went on politicians' timelines. The wheels of justice only move when greased up by the people in this room, by young people around the country, by the poor, by the marginalized. And I'll say it again, the time is now. The time is now. 50 years ago, a woman died in Kew Gardens. Today, young people die around this country. Today, an unprecedented number of our soldiers kill themselves every day for lack of medical care. The problems are numerous, but the solutions are at our root. They are humanity, they are love, they are solidarity. And I forgot one, power. There are many definitions for power. Some people may say it is the ability to act, the ability to do, the ability to move, the ability to catalyze a reaction. Black nationalists would say it's the ability to define phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner. I see nothing but power in this room but locked in a potential state. There's much work to do outside these walls. I'm proud and very, very, very humbled to be by your side during this moment, to be with all of you all in this moment, both domestically and internationally, because we have an opportunity to tip the scales towards justice. We have an opportunity to win. I watched a commercial yesterday, and I'll end with this. ESPN, where I get the majority of my news. <laughs> and the voiceover on one of the commercials said very simply, those with the will to win will win. And I believe that we 
will win. I, I believe, I believe that, I believe that we, I believe that we will, I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. Thank you very much. As, as, as I end my comments here, it is not my prayer that our paths cross again. For it is my prayer that our paths never veer far from one another. I came to you all humble, in solidarity, in love, in humanity, and in power. Let's do this, and let's get involved. Okay, we have time for three questions. Three questions. Well, I won't take them because, yeah, you will go ahead. Go ahead. Question is, you know, in terms of building solidarity, a lot of the movements in the past, whether it was with King or with Cesar Chavez, relied on faith. Faith played a really important role in them, and it wasn't, it wasn't an exclusive faith. It was a very inclusive inclusive version of it. Um, for example, the first person who died at a protest led by Cesar Chavez was actually a Yemeni Muslim, mm -hmm. uh, as I recently found out. So I was just wondering, do you think faith has a role to play today in these movements? Because now when we look back at them, we tend to secularize them and just throw faith out of it. And I was wondering if you could right. talk about that. I do. I do. I grew up in church. I'm not uh, a church-going man now. Um, but I grew up in it, and I, I still believe in the tenets of religion or, or, or of, of spirituality and of the Bible. Um, have you all heard of Marshall Gans? Okay, a few folks have heard of Marshall Gans. Um, I had the, the opportunity to meet with them and talk to them, and they're reading the Bible, and I'll get to the answer, if you, I promise. They're reading the Bible now. I asked him why, he said he's, he, He's not very religious either, but he, he reads the Bible, I believe, if I remember correct, with an imam, a priest, a rabbi, and a number of folks that lead their denominations in a, in a number of other denominations. And they're reading it because, along with the Quran and the Torah, and, and I don't want to misspeak a, a number of other texts, but they're reading them because the church is the most organized function in mankind. And these are the books that help to organize the most organized structure in mankind. And so he told me, as we talked, he would quote Bible scriptures to me, but it wouldn't be from a religious place. It would, it would be from a, just a beauty of the word place. Um, and so I'm, I'm usually, I call upon that a lot. And you asked about faith. I think there is a place for faith um, in the movement, a very big place. We, Dr. King kept the moral high ground. That was what provided us through nonviolence with the opportunity to show how evil the system was. Um, I think a vision is very important, but faith is at the crux of everything that we're doing. In the Bible, it says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's, that's something lawyers could use, right? The faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Circumstantial, right? Law and order, man. All right, so, and so, and if you look at dreams, dreams are the ability to imagine the impossible. And so we may change the words, but I do believe that faith, every day you have to wake up with hope. Hope is a revolutionary act in this society and the system that we live in. And so faith is, a, is at the crux. Do I, do I know or believe or think that this movement will be led from the pulpit? It could be. As I said, the church is the most organized structure in the world. If clergy were able to get on, get on one page and from their pulpit catalyze people and liberate people and move people, and we, we could do amazing things. I don't know if that is happening across the board, and I don't know if it'll be like that again, um, but I do believe that it has a place. And a movement without faith 
a movement without morality, a movement without the ability to call upon humanity is doomed to fail. Is doomed to fail, especially, uh, I'll use another uh, scholar named Sean Carter. You never, you never argue with fools because people from a distance can't tell who is who. And so the, 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 the meaning of that is there has to be a difference. There has to be something in antithesis to what, um, what, what the system or the country offers. And so we've, we've got we've to combat love with hate with love. We've got to combat violence with nonviolence um, at this time. So does that answer your question? I was wondering what you could say about uh, getting more young people involved with movements who might be feel slightly outside of them. Um, thoughts on tactics or just how to mm -hmm. bring people into the fold? Yep, got to talk to them. You got to you. We we've got to uh, you. You got to meet people where they are. We have to meet people where they are. It is it is a, a notion that's put out that young people are apathetic that young people don't care, that young people are disenchanted. I, I don't believe any of that. All of that is bull. All of it is. The young people that I know, they know about the issues. They know about racial profiling, mass incarceration, school to prison pipeline, gender, gender inequality, economic inequality, because that's their life. And so it's not about how do we get them involved. It's how do we build a movement that allows them to find their space in it and advance it. And there's not a one road way into this thing. Um, you know, there's, there's artists, there are, there, are, there are lawyers, right? There are people in different walks of life and we've gotta be a diverse movement. And so um, tactics, uh, culture. I think culture is a big part of uh, what we're talking about. We're talking about how to change people's language. Um, how to change, um, we're, we're getting into the, the clothes that we wear, the t-shirts that we wear, um, are using lines from hip hop songs and then calling them back to us. Um, so Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar may not admit, even though I believe he did, he might not admit the most revolutionary thing when he said good kids, mad cities, um, or he may have, may have been talking about his personal experience, but I do believe that we're good kids living in mad cities, not the, not the inverse. Um, when 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 Drake said start it from the bottom, look, I, you can say what you want about Aubrey. Look, the the fact of the matter is the ma the fact of the matter is where I come from, the people that I know, we are very familiar with the bottom. We're very familiar with having to live to survive. And so when we say that, we're calling that back to our culture. When, when another Drake quote, dang, he said he said uh, he said he said oh, he said. People never loved us. I was trying to figure out how to say. He said, and so uh, in, the, in the wake of the, the Dunn verdict, we started saying America never loved us. Um, just, to, just to remind folks that, you know, the things that are going on in America are not new. This is a part of a system. And we're very well aware that we're not looking for love from a country that never loved us. And so these verdicts aren't a surprise to us because this is our daily life. And so culture. I would say culture is something very big because the way our the way culture or consumerism and, and capitalism and every ism is so insidious is that now our, our, our children are learning how to see themselves in society. They're learning about economics. They're learning about how to treat women, how to treat men, how to conduct themselves in social circles, all from music now, all from clothing now, um, and all from television now, all from radio now. And so if that's going to be a way to reach the people, then we need to find a way to own that and take that back because it's being used by the mother state to, to do all type of things. And so um, taking that back is a big part of really getting the young people. Um, and you gotta listen. You have, we have to listen more. I'm 28 years old. I've been holding on to the youth thing as long as possible, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm dragging behind the wagon right now. I'm not, it's, it, you know, I, I can't do that for long and so, um, it's got to be. It's got to be a space, and we're we're not proficient at it. Dream Defenders started off as a college-based organization, so a youth to us was 18 years old, a freshman. Um, but there are young people that are going through the the gutter right now, being run through the ringer, and so it has to be built around them. 
and it doesn't have to be over here and we say yo get with it get right or get left it has to be it has to be built around them with them at the center um, their views their perceptions their their analysis on the world um, and also young people are where you're gonna get your most hope as much as I love y'all third grade if I was in a room full of third graders I probably would have just been running all you know what I'm saying that that is where I mean that is where you get your refuel that's the lifeblood every social movement that we're really looking to um, has been led by young people um, we they got the t we got the time the energy the the, the analysis of the world, and we still haven't become jaded by, you know, years and years of getting chiseled into a school, a student, so. So Trayvon's Law was actually a name we gave to three or three uh, issue areas that we were drafting legislation around. So school to prison pipeline, racial profiling, and, and stand your ground. Um, we want a repeal of stand your ground. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any ifs, ands, or buts about that. Strategically, we thought we could have gotten a reform um, this year. We weren't able to do that. Um, our school to prison pipeline bill um, did not pass during session, um, but it was what it did was limited the the number of offenses which were arrestable by a school resource officer. Did I say that right, Amon? Okay. Um, and so, and then the racial profiling bill, which we were developing in concert with the Advancement Project, ACLU, SPLC, it's we, we we're bringing it back. It, still, it rises. And so, um, our work right now, how it looks is. Well, one thing I do want to talk about a victory. Um, we did uh, uh, have an amendment on the budget this session that provided greater oversight over private prison providers um, that come into the state. Before that, I could do, I, I'm private prison company A, I could just run amok in Georgia and then they kick me out and go to Florida and Florida wouldn't even ask like, yo, what happened with Georgia? Like, they would just, you know, they could know about it, but it wasn't a part of the screening process. And so we're trying to add um, obstacles as incremental as we can. The larger answer to your question, though, is that we have a Republican-led legislature in the state of Florida that is at the behest of special interests, private prisons, the NRA. Um, their values don't reflect the agenda or values of many of the people in this room, and definitely not the young people, poor people in the state of Florida. And so our vision moving forward, and we're going through a whole strategic planning process um, at two years old. You usually want to do that at the beginning, um, but we just kind of got in there. Um, but we're, we're base building, capacity building. We need more people. We need more people. Um, and so in order to change and reform or repeal Stand Your Ground, we need, a, we need many more allies and we need many more people in local districts being able to move those people outside of just the 30 days at the Capitol. The 30 days at the Capitol was inspirational, the best time of my life, the most impactful thing I've ever done in my life. I wouldn't trade it for the world, but those 30 days um, without a, maybe you know 10,000 more people won't sway legislation. Um, and so our job and where we are right now is to move anger into electoral action on the local level. And so that's what we're building around. We're educating young people, we're politicizing young people, and the goal is we capture enough young people from 12 to 18 years old that the first time they vote, they're voting with a dream defender lens on it. They're voting with a progressive lens on it. They're voting with a radical notion of, listen, my vote is currency. I'm not gonna put it in a wishing well or a slot machine. I'm about to put it in something that invests in the future of my local community. And so that's what we're focusing on now. Um, we're calling it uh, civic enragement. That's what we're calling it. And so um, the, goal is, the goal is to say, I know you're mad. I'm mad with you, and I don't want you to chill. But here, here, here are some options that we have. Um, these are some things. This is the vision. This, if you have faith, this is, the, this is the path to building power for us and, and, and get people moving in that direction. Do we have time for one more? Oh, okay. Well, thank you all very, very much. Thank you.
Come on, folks. Give him a real round of applause. Yeah, you're not off the hook. <laughs> He's really itching to get off the stage, but we, we have one more uh, little surprise for you. You know, you have been going, you've been going campus to campus, person to person, city to city in Florida. And um, sometimes, especially when you're doing organizing that's very locally based, uh, you don't always feel connected in really tangible ways to your brothers and sisters that are fighting all over the world. So we just wanted to give you a little something so that you know that we have been watching what you all have been building in Florida. We have been deeply inspired by your work. We are learning from you. And we, um, we're taking the lessons of your organizing, of your legal work, um, but more deeply of the heart, of the love that you're bringing into all of the relationships that you're building. And um, that is feeding our work in places like Palestine, South Africa, India, Mexico, New Orleans, New York, and many of the other places that are represented in this room here today. So on behalf of the Bertha Justice Institute and the Center for Constitutional Rights, I would like to present you, Philip Agnew, with the 2014 Community Defender Award for your leadership, your vision, and your excellence in promoting social justice and your commitment to building power for the marginalized and the disenfranchised. One more round of applause, please, for Philip Agnew. Shout out to Sophia Ahmad over there. I had to look directly over there. That that I'm, I'm I know I'm, my time is up, but listen, <laughs> listen. This is not about me at all. I do appreciate this, and my mother appreciates this. My father appreciates this. <laughs> but we wouldn't be able to be here if it weren't for people that were keeping this work going every single day. And I get lucky to be able to come here because I sound like a preacher. Thank you all very, very much. I really appreciate it.